So picture this young girl. You know, she doesn't know any better. She's got her own baggage. And all of a sudden now she gets tempted to go into that club scene. And what happens? She does something, something that she's not proud of because there's, there's a lot of spiritual activity going on in them clubs, right? And then she does something that she regrets. You can think of a lot of things that could have happened, right? And then she has to hide behind that mask and pretend everything's okay. But what's happening is there's a fracturing that's going on on the inside. And another day we'll talk about the details there. But, but you end up living this roller coaster ride of having to be different things to different people depending on who you're with. Instead of just being the child of God that God made you to be and comfortable in your own skin and caring more about what he thinks about us than what other people think about us. And in the cancel culture, that's just foreign. It's all about how many likes and getting canceled, all that stuff. No, you don't get canceled in God's kingdom. You know your identity and you operate in it. And if they leave you that quickly, they were never your friend in the first place. So God's doing you a favor. He's revealing the counterfeits early. You don't want to be with that. But this is a very serious condition because who am I? I'm not who I was before I went into that club. I feel defiled by what happened. I feel fractured and fragmented, and I'm having to live almost like a double life and lying to cover up for myself. So can God restore our innocence, or is it permanently lost? Yeah, but you wouldn't believe how many people you'll meet that think it's gone forever. They don't believe in the supernatural power of God to restore innocence. And George Meyer would even go another step further and say, he made it so that I'm better off on the other side of the trauma because now I can help people come out of that. Same thing that was used against me. What the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good. Joseph's brothers, he says it to them. What you meant for death, God meant for your life. Ooh, boy, that's a different economy, isn't it? And I'm glad a lot of you said, yes, you, you can be restored because that's the right answer. By the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself back to its original intent. Restore to innocence again. Come on. Restore to innocence again. Colossians 1.20. And again, it's not like you'd be better off if those bad things never happened. I know in many cases that's hard to imagine that that could be true. But it only could be better on this side if God uses it to turn you into the person that could go help somebody else out of that situation. Because when you've lived it, you have authority to help other people come out of it. Books are great. Books are great, but nothing is like living it. Oh, boy. Got to have both. So now she's got the king of kings on her head. You see it? She's got a crown. My, uh, my identity has been renewed. I'm covered. I'm covered by people who love me. They look a little crazy during worship, but, but they're radical for Jesus. They love, but it's not just my head. It's got to go from here to here. Because this is what we're supposed to guard. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. And you could be saying the right things, repeating other people's lines, but what, what you believe is what's in your heart. So you need both. You, you know, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But also, guard your heart. And that's where the innocence really has to be restored is back in our hearts. We have, to, we have to find a reason to say, why should I even try again? I've been so defiled by what the world did to me, I could never get it back. That's a lie. Resurrection power. He does all things well. If anyone's in Christ, new creation. New creation. Innocence can be restored. That will be a title of another day's message. How's that? So now I'm going on to the rules of engagement, and Paul is talking to a young pastor named Timothy who he loves, and he says the, the Spirit very clearly tells us that in the last days, some will abandon the faith because of their devotion to spirits sent to deceive and sabotage. Think that's applicable today? Any spirits in the culture that are sent to deceive and sabotage? What can you think of? I can think of a bunch. People that want to tell our children they can be sexualized at seven years old. And they're going to use my money, my taxes, to pay for that curriculum. No. What don't you understand? The N or the O? We're going to have a school as a church. 
I'm just telling you now. I'm telling you, I'm not leaving the planet. I'm not leaving the planet till that happens. Because what good is it complaining about it if you don't offer an alternative? And you don't encourage people to run for the school boards. That's the ultimate real answer. But we need to give people an alternative. And if you're a teacher here, I don't mean to, I don't mean to demean anybody here. Because I know there's amazing teachers. But it's also hard to, to swim upstream sometimes and go against what they're telling you to do. It's just one of many examples we could use. And they end up following the doctrine of demons. Whew. They'll be carried away by the hypocrisy of liars. Now, he's saying, in these last days, that's what's going to happen to these people, not because we don't like them. It's the rules of engagement. You have to recognize that they don't know what you know. And when Jesus looked at the crowds, he had compassion on them. He wasn't approving of their behavior, but he was approving of who they were made to be. So we don't want to be so defiled by people's behavior that we forget that he wants them to get saved. He doesn't want one person to perish. Wow, what a promise that is, right? Whose consciousness have been seared with a red hot iron. This says branded, but I never forgot. That was my state. My conscience was seared with a hot iron. I was raised to have morals and values, but the need for me to get the approval of my peers was more important. So I was willing to do things that I would not have wanted to do in order to reach the goal of being the man, whatever that means in your world. And I really had to repent because, I, like I said, it was a trail of wreckage, including my own life. And, and really, I've said it many times, I should not be alive today. That's just true. But I am. <laughs> God wins. <laughs> Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. Corrupting many. Mm. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Bitter root judgments. Be careful. Guard your heart. Renew your mind. Make sure that no one is immoral like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. Afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. Can I just give you a minute window on this story? Right? It was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But Esau was Jacob's brother. And Jacob's got a bad reputation as a deceiver, right? You know the rules about firstborn. The firstborn received a double portion than, than the younger children in the family. Why? Because they were expected to take over for the father when the father died. So with the double portion, you also got much more responsibility. Not an easy job. So Esau comes in from the field hungry one day, and he says, I'm starving to death, and all... All Jacob said was, well, I'll trade you a bowl of porridge for, for your birthright. And Esau says, well, what good's the birthright going to do me if I die? You think he was going to die? I mean, did he think he was going to die? No, he was just hungry. His, his flesh was whining. I'm hungry. <laughs> this is serious, though, because he was willing to take a very sobering, important thing that God holds in high esteem and he just dismissed it and said, you know, you could have it for a bowl of porridge. <laughs> Careful, right? If that sounds harsh, that it was too late for Esau's repentance, here's how I want you to think about it. In the New Testament here, it's never too late to repent for something. But because the Father had already given the blessing, it was too late to change it. And it wasn't that Jacob deceived him about that because he voluntarily gave him for a bowl of parch, he gave it away. Now he did deceive him later. I know, you know, the whole thing with the parents, but just but think about your decision sometimes can be irrevocable. It doesn't mean God won't forgive and move on, but whatever that thing was supposed to be, you don't always get another chance to do it. And there was a song when I was growing up, I never forgot it. It's too late when we die to admit we don't see eye to eye. I don't know if any of you remember this. It's called the living years. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then the third verse, I wasn't there that morning when my father passed away. I didn't get to tell him all the things I had to say. I think I caught his spirit later that same year. I'm sure I heard his echo in my newborn baby's tears. I just wish I could have told him in the living years. That's regret. So then the chorus says, say it loud. 
Say it clear. You can tell them you love them while they're here. This sounds Christian. Because it's too late when we die to admit that we don't see eye to eye. Say la. Holidays are coming up. Going to be with family. Tell them that you love them while they're here. You might not agree about the election or eight billion other things. But we're family. Mm -hmm. you're, you're the diamond. You're the solitary diamond in that family, maybe. You're the only one saved. Don't be religious.